everybody was in or uh, it was possible to to do everything from home because some celebrations you gotta be uh, maybe uh, presential somewhere I guess no no oh, yeah we, we couldn't go out and celebrate uh, this time much but still uh, people did go out for shopping and uh, meeting their relatives so yeah it was uh, not exactly adhering to all the covid uh, norms some or the rules so was little tricky we may expect a spike now post the festival season because a lot of people were out so let's see again there is a little bit of a surge in the covid post festival I understand. Yeah, uh, because, our services uh, are getting back to normal here, and uh, people are talking a lot about the uh, second wave, but we are not quite right. so sure whether there is a second wave actually or not. So we got to be very, right. still very careful and uh, uh, doing whatever is necessary, like uh, wearing masks. And yeah, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Doing everything else, so that's the way. The way to do. Right, and, right. Uh, I think uh, Aishwara, how you are? How are you doing, Aishwara? Hi, sir. I'm doing great. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thanks. You gave a very good idea for next week, so we could talks uh, of uh, give a talk of uh, about uh, genetics yes sir and this is very good and uh, uh, who is going to speak on that subject uh, so we have a dr rajkumar uh, who is a clinical uh, gen geneticist of uh, aditya jyotai hospital so uh, i have already contacted him and he said he would like to give a talk on uh, genotype phenotype pedigree charting and its importance in ophthalmology Genetics of yeah, retinoblastoma and RP. Yeah, this is very interesting. We had this uh, RP uh, lecture recently uh, into our service uh, for people from Zoom. Uh, that was cool, but uh, of course we had something on genetics, but not very much so. And I think we should learn this part too, and it's important for the residency programs to get to know but deep, deeper on that. I think it's in, interesting. And uh, so uh, I will start, J. Deep. Very interesting discussion yeah. on uh, macular hole. We all do macular hole surgeries. And, right. uh, you know, things have changed a lot since years ago. I remember when I did my retina fellowship uh, in Toronto, back in 1997, a long time ago. And uh, at that time, people were starting uh, to think of ILM, but not very much so. But uh, the regular way of doing the macular hole surgery was, was put. And I remember into the OR with uh, Dr. Deveni, uh, he used to centrifugate the blood and uh, uh -huh. put the blood over the macular hole after the vitrectomy. Yeah, yeah. So in that yeah, sense, uh, yeah, okay. yeah uh -huh. people still do that. And uh, the right, hole right, right. Uh, closed. And uh, he had a, a higher percentage of closing the macular hole. And uh, by the time I was leaving the retina fellowship there, people were, people were starting to peel the ILM. And so yeah, right. I'm going to put on some slides here, we realized yeah. that removing the ILM increased a lot the likelihood of uh, closing the uh, macular hole. So I think most of people, most people today do macular hole surgery with uh, the ILM pill. And uh, there are far more techniques because, you know, uh, different ways of taking care and uh, that's what I want to 
show you. So I will let me share here my 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 screen. What is this? Let me let me share just a second. I have this. Um, yeah, so talking about uh, uh, Mac Hall, I have a brief introduction. We know uh, the fact of the foveal retina involving its full thickness from the ILM to the outer segment of the photoreceptor layer. And so first described by Knapp in 1869, Oglive uh, 1900s and uh, 1970 to 80% uh, found out to be idiopathic and 10% uh, trauma. And uh, the etiology, there are several etiologies as we know, and uh, most that, that we know, they are idiopathic. We have these uh, vitro synergies and the uh, posterior vitro separation and all the causes such as uh, CME, trauma, contusion, and uh, regmatogenous retinal detachments, uh, with sex full repaired or not, and the pro progressive myopia with the uh, foveal schizis. So there are uh, many, many uh, uh, causes. And uh, we find the contraction of prefoveolar uh, vitroscotics, uh, pseudocyst formation at the fovea. The high sense in the, uh, of pseudocyst in the Miller cell cone leads to full thickness macular hole, contraction of the internal limiting membrane. And traumatic, as we know for the results are not as good as uh, the idiopathic macular holes after surgery, that, but uh, they still close. Some of them are large, and uh, we have uh, techniques for that. And uh, as you see here, uh, the uh, importance of removing the ILM, as we know that uh, it could cause contraction, but even though it seems not to be, in some cases, but uh, when we remove the ILM, the uh, outcome is a lot better. And uh, uh, from epidemiology, that varies uh, also according uh, to the uh, population. And uh, it's more common in the females than in males, uh, older ones, and seven to eighth decade, uh, only 90% due to trauma, 1.9% uh, visually impaired and uh, not associated with uh, medical disease or refractive errors. And uh, of course, full thickness gives you a significant uh, visual loss. And uh, the holes will progress in size and stage. And uh, these are from uh, the anatomy. And uh, we know that, uh, to make it uh, shorter, that uh, the more you involve in the deeper, and when you involve more of the photoreceptors, and uh, uh, you have uh, less, uh, worse outcome. And uh, more from uh, the pathogenesis, it's just a review, and uh, 1924, Lister, uh, stated this uh, vitro as, uh, as a pathogenesis of a macular hole, and then came gas in 1988, vitro macular traction theory, focal shrinkage of foveal vitreous cortex, intraretinal foveolar cyst formation, and roofing of the cyst. And so the cyst was uh, there, and uh, we have also the hydration theory, post hyaluronic traction of the fovea, tearing in the fovea, seepage of fluid vitreous into spongy layers of the macular a cavity in the inner retina, enlargement of holes spread to the outer retina, and swollen retina remains elevated and re retracted. And the retinochoroidal ischemic theory, there is also this theory for uh, the macular hole formation, RPE dysfunction, and possible intraretinal fluid accumulation in the fovea. Of course, when we have the RPE involved, the outcome is uh, worse. And uh, involutional retinal thinning. And uh, this is interesting to see. Aishwara and uh, everybody else. It's interesting to see yeah. that uh, you have some uh, ways of uh, getting the hole. Let me put this uh, better here. And if you have, uh, you like uh, on the slide and the writings above, normal retina. 
And then you have a centripetal traction of the uh, uh, epiretinal membrane. Then you could have a pseudo macular hole. And with the progression of the epiretinal uh, membrane, the tissue progression, and then you could get a lamellar macular hole. And with the hissence of the outer retinal tissue, a full thickness macular hole. They all the way around from uh, above here to the right, disruption of the foveal cyst or anterior posterior tractum, vitreal macular tractum, uh, formation of inner retinal cysts or trans tangential tractum, as, as we know more, uh, aporetinal membrane, partial PVD with eccentric vitreal retinal adhe uh, adherence. And then you could have the hissence of the outer retinal tissue. And uh, this uh, with a, a anterior posterior tractum, vitreal foveal tractum of the partial with a partial PVD. And then you get this uh, macular hole in, in total. And of course, the visual acuity drops from uh, the evolution that could happen with the formation of the macular hole. So these are our mechanisms. And we have uh, the uh, old but still good classification for the macular holes, stage one, stage two, stage three, and there's a stage four. And uh, you see this perifoveal PVD, yellow spot or ring contraction in the stage uh, classification stage one. The split milio cell con, foveal, foveal uh, pseudocysts, uh, not full thickness, metamorphopsia, the symptom happening, visual acuity is still good, 2040, and uh, full thickness whole, 30%, partial thickness, uh, they stay uh, same, but 50 show improvement. So that could get better, well better into this stage, unless it goes to stage two, eccentric or oval full thickness, uh, less than 400 microns, the uh, macular hole. Visual acuity now is uh, from 2050 to 2080, 74 progress to stage three. In the stage three, we have a larger hole, more than 400 microns and foveal edema surrounding the neural retinal rim detachment, operculum, ILM, middle cell cone, handless layer, and the cone nuclei. And the visual acuity now here is at 2000 to 20. 400, and uh, of course, stage four, then you have the complete vitreous separation and the uh, full thickness macular hole. And uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, at this time, when they published Kelly and Wendell in 1991, the vitreous surgery for idiopathic macular holes, and that uh, the results of their pilot study by Neo, Kelly, and uh, Wendell, Robert, in the archives of ophthalmology in 1991, uh, this paper was very interesting. So there was not uh, a real treatment at that time for the macular hole that used to be observed, the PVD to be observed also at its slit lamp because uh, we did not have an uh, OCT at the, that time and uh, maybe ultrasound could uh, well show the uh, PVD, but they uh, guess a device for, uh, you know, uh, his classification and you know, observing the PVD. And uh, we knew that the PVD protected against the macular hole. And uh, from the knowledge uh, learned from uh, Professor White uh, in, uh, in Toronto back years ago, and we know that the patient that has a PVD already in the fellow eye, the chances of him getting the macular hole are uh, far less because the uh, PVD is already there, so you don't have very much traction on the uh, macular surface. So uh, the uh, uh, development of macular hole in the fellow eye of one eye that has a macular hole, the other eye has this PVD is far less. And 60% uh, success rate with vitrectomy and gas, but they did not talk about uh, the ILM, and so. Uh, everybody tried the surgery, the success is uh, variable. And uh, by the late uh, 90s, and uh, still we had this, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I went to Toronto for my retinal fellowship before, after I did a fellowship here in Brazil, I went there for another retinal fellowship with my professor, uh, 
White Lamb and uh, Dr. Devenia was with him in the OR and uh, he still uh, centrifugated the uh, blood and uh, also uh, thinking of blood, uh, we have here platelets, but this blood was put on the macular hole surface and the, the macular hole closed more. But then one year later, people started to, to uh, try the ILM pill. And uh, that was interesting on in those times that uh, we know that we have to uh, ask the patient to stay in the face down positioning. But there are more works saying that uh, it's not 100% necessary. And uh, even Linkoff, I watched uh, Linkoff's uh, lecture. Uh, Many years ago in an American Academy of Ophthalmology, I guess I remember it was in Orlando. He was saying that uh, without positioning, you could well close the uh, macular hole. But uh, interesting is that by that time, people tried and people started doing the surgery when they're facing down and uh, things started to work. And uh, this is very interesting to show that uh, not for faint-hearted. Of course, <laughs> you need very good technique to and uh, good forceps and uh, patience to remove the uh, ILM because uh, used to be almost invisible. Well, of course, it's translucent, but if you have the uh, appropriate ties and then the, uh, you well uh, you can well see the uh, macular hole. And uh, as we discussed this, uh, J. Deep, I remember I uh, we started with uh, we myself and uh, in, in Canada as well, we started with uh, uh, ICG with the dye uh, of uh, uh, ILM that was cool. And uh, many years ago, I switched to Brilliant Blue, which I used uh, until today. And uh, I like Brilliant Blue because it stays, stains very well the ILM for me. And uh, we improved increase the chances of getting uh, the hole closed by 90% or more, as we know. And uh, this is another uh, other slide from uh, uh, Ryan to show the stages on the right. You see 1A, 1B, and then uh, this compares with uh, the stage 2, less than 400 microns. And uh, then you have stage 3, more than 400 microns the pathology and uh, for full thickness macular hole, as the, you know from uh, gas books, this uh, is a very famous and known picture. You see down below a complete separation of the uh, vitreous and uh, stage four macular hole. And uh, this is interesting that I want to discuss with you. Uh, the uh, macular hole uh, classification based on the ultrasound. This is a slide for from uh, Dr. Lam, Wajim Lam. He gave this uh, lecture translated into English and Chinese. And uh, less than 10% cases of macular hole fail to close. So today the chances of getting the hole closed are very high. Stage four with PVD, large macular hole over uh, 400 microns, myopic degeneration, uh, chronic macular hole, and the non-idiopathic secondary macular holes, they might give you more work and less chances uh, of uh, uh, getting it closed. But still the regular cases, uh, they close very well. And uh, interesting that the OCT-based classification from 2013, shows that they, they uh, the OCT classifications, uh, they don't take into consideration uh, the uh, uh, gas classification, uh, partially, of course, but not the first the stage one. They don't have the stage one. They have the, uh, uh, from the stage two on, the vitro macular traction that should be uh, less or equal uh, one this diameter. And then this the traction uh, a small one, the, the aparetinal tissue on the uh, uh, whole area you have, if you have a very small full thickness macular hole, less than 250 microns, you could well observe because 
uh, it might spontaneously close. It might not close, but it could spontaneously close. If you have a very small full thickness macular hole, less than 250 microns, with some vitro macular traction uh, less than the one this diameter, 1500 microns and uh, or 1.5 millimeters and uh, this uh, pharmacological vitrolysis bioclipasmin i have never tried this but uh, we had uh, many people here in brazil uh, starting and then doing for a while and then uh, after some months people discontinued but uh, that could well work to dissolve and uh, to detach the posterior vitreous and make the surgery easier and also helped by numeric vitrolysis, vitrolysis with uh, CTF8 or SF6 and positioning. And uh, these are uh, techniques that could still be used, but just uh, for historical point of view, uh, we mentioned, uh, but uh, not very many people used to do that, including me. And uh, if you have the uh, full thickness macular hole more than 250 microns or vitro macular traction and then a vitro macular traction more than uh, 500, uh, I mean 500 microns, and then it requires surgical intervention. And so it's uh, good that you have o today the uh, OCT to look at the macular area and decide on whether doing the surgery or not. And uh, uh, it, this is uh, just uh, repeating what we, we said. <clears throat> and I collect this uh, slide to show you that it's important that you see your patient and uh, measure uh, the visual acuity. In the past, people used to take into consideration uh, the visual acuity. It, it, for, if it was good, they could better uh, wait. But today we have uh, more things to look at. We have the out, uh, ultrasound, we have the other eye, we have the fellow eye, we have the shape of the hole, we have uh, the evolution. So we might not be waiting too much if you have an OCT showing that the uh, macular hole is over 250 microns and it's getting larger. And uh, if you have over uh, 1,500 uh, microns, the uh, vitro macular traction. So, we have the uh, Watsky Allen test. I still use it to show the residents as well, because you could well differentiate between the macular hole and uh, the uh, pseudo hole. You place a very thin slit at the slit lamp uh, inside the uh, pupil's eye with the 78 uh, uh, condensing lens, for example, and then you put that well over the foveal area, and you see that thinning, and the people usually say it's uh, uh, thinner that way, and uh, that helps a lot. So that's what we had years ago, and uh, we still have to look at the patient uh, with those uh, simpler things. Also, FFA, we have the transmission defects, OCT, and uh, scanning laser ophthalmoscope, we are not using that anymore. And one thing that is not mentioned here is the RTA. I had the honor and the pleasure to use the retinal thickness analyzer many years ago, and uh, it was discontinued due to better options, including first the uh, scanning laser ophthalmoscope, and then it came the OCT many, many years ago. And uh, the uh, RTA uh, gave me very good and beautiful cuts from the macular hole. So we still could follow up the patient after doing surgery or in before and uh, with the RTA. I don't know, have you heard of the RTA, uh, J-DIP? Retinal thickness analyzer? Yeah, I have, I have heard about it. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. heard about it. For sure, for but sure. But wasn't it used more for glaucoma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, also for glaucoma. For sure, Natarajan had this uh, RTA. He, he probably has some uh, in the, some room and uh, without being touched anymore because, <laughs> you know, it's something yeah, historical. Yeah. But it, it's, it was good. Mm -hmm. no, I right, don't, absolutely. I understand why people just discontinued that so fast. And so differential right. diagnosis that uh, we went over that, uh, so the whole uh, fo foveal RPE atrophy, CME, and uh, Drusen, and uh, more, and especially lamellar 
macular lesions. And uh, as we discussed on the visual acuity, you drop the visual acuity with the evolution of the macular hole. And uh, if you have stage one, you have some metamorphopsia. And then stage two and three, and the things get worse. And uh, you could see with the uh, indirect ophthalmoscope or direct of tomoscope. Of course, I only use the indirect uh, those days and uh, the appearances of the macular hole and the microscopy makes it easier. And as, as we were talking about dyes, I, I prefer brilliant blue. What, what do you prefer in the JD Panchwara using the uh, ICG or brilliant blue? No, we, we use brilliant blue. I think uh, ICG has been discontinued by everybody. Um, I uh, probably think uh, post-2009, 10 onwards, uh, nobody has been using ICG because of the toxicity. Yeah, yeah, I know that in some countries, as I mentioned here uh, with us talking in uh, different lectures. In Hong Kong, for example, Dr. Lam cannot use the ICG, he cannot even use the uh, brilliant blue because of these toxicity concerns. He, uh, uh -huh. they use a tri triple blue there and I triple watched blue. some, yeah, triple uh -huh. blue and from Oshima in Japan as well. And uh, I saw very good surgeries from him, but uh, you did not see very well. You had this faint uh, staining of the ILM with the uh, triple blue, but still can be okay. And uh, I had to dilute it uh, sometimes. Uh, here and use it in oh. the, some of my uh, macular hole surgeries some years ago when the, uh, uh, one time or two times uh, we did not have the uh, brilliant blue, blue available but still I wanted to use and uh, I diluted yeah. the uh, triple blue. So and when I was doing my residency uh, that time Dr. Natarajan was using ICG I think way back in 2006, seven those days so uh, subsequently, I think post 2009, uh, we stopped using uh, this ICG. Uh, yes. And switched to brilliant blue. Good ideas, yeah. Yes, uh, you have, you know, recently I was, I was watching some lectures from uh, elsewhere in the Zoom, and uh, we had this uh, meeting Zooming in on Retina by Dr. Shaw from Canada, and uh, they showed. A uh, uh, different brilliant blue there, and there's some more options coming out on the market. So we have options, as uh, you see here, as I mentioned, the uh, Watske Allen test, uh, there's lit lamp and classifications, and uh, OCT helps you see more, and the FA, these are just uh, examples that we MS agreed, and it's good to have. And uh, I have one <laughs> on my pocket, but uh, I, I won't lie. I use, but I'm not using that much. I have to. I, it needs to be in my pocket all the time. Otherwise, we won't make the test. It's so simple test, and we have to teach the which, patient. Which test? To, to, there, are this uh, Amazon grid. So simple. Amazon grid, right, right, right. Yeah, right, so right, simple absolutely. tests. He covers the yeah. good eye and tests the bad eye, and then they switch over to the other eye. It takes. Uh, it's very good for AMD, and uh, we have to teach the patient. Of course, we have. Uh, 4C home, you have a lot more uh, things to do, but not very many people, people especially people that cannot uh, buy these uh, things and uh, be included in the studies, they have to use the Amazon grid. And uh, we went over already the uh, differential diagnosis. And uh, many studies, you know, of plasma in Gitria. And uh, have you used Gitria in, uh, in your service? Recently, uh, no, no, actually, Jetria has n never been uh, uh, approved in India till date, so we haven't got Jetria in India ever. So oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, I don't think anybody has used in India. Maybe if they have imported it and uh, like used it off label, but otherwise, it's not available in India. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And I think it's uh, pretty expensive, also probably for patients to. Afford. Yeah. Okay. If I, if I, it's my opinion, uh, if I have the uh, stage three or four, but uh, you know, uh, this is easier for you to think of operating. I won't, wouldn't wait much, but you have the transition from uh, one to two. And uh, if you look at 
the OCD classifications is if you have this stage with, uh, you know, the whole uh, 250 microns mm -hmm. with still some right. vitro macro adherences and adhesions and tractions there, but not very much with good visual acuity. I would wait, but not very much so because I have followed and I will show you uh, a case where we followed the patient's uh, uh, retina and uh, the fellow eye. And uh, actually, we did the operation for the macular hole of one eye, and then we just kept following up the other eye. And this other eye had exactly like this, had this uh, vitro macular adhesion, but not very much. And then he developed the lamellar and uh, then came to a full thickness macular hole, so we had to operate. So I, I don't, I myself, I don't wait too long. And so, I, yeah. yeah, we have to think of other things and for stage two or higher one, uh, lamella holes, uh, maybe we could, uh, because if you have a lamella hole and uh, traction that comes out with the PVD and uh, that could well close spontaneously, but it's not very common, but it happens and we have many cases and many people show. Yes. Uh, in lectures, uh, spontaneous closure of macular holes. Spontaneous closure, yeah, yeah, it's absolutely possible. So, as you said, smaller holes, probably less than 200, 250 microns, you can observe for some time just to see if they are closing on their own. Yeah, also counterindications uh, for, you know, surgery. The best timing, it's usually less than one year. Of course, I usually... Uh, tell my fellows that six months less, uh, but then if the staging is okay and uh, I will go right away for the surgery, I wouldn't wait much. And uh, I have the tendency to do early right. surgeries for these uh, these cases. And uh, this I'm going to show you. I was I remember by doing the, my first vitrectomies, we had to look at the fish strike sign doing the, uh, you know, the silicone tip. Uh, like a left back flush cannula there, and uh, to see whether we engage the uh, posterior hyaloid, uh, very attached to one. But today we have uh, so very good visualization systems and macular lenses. I like to be searching for these uh, PVDs and adherences with the macular lens because after doing the core vitrectomy, and that makes it easier for me to see. And uh, usually for the vitreous, I don't like uh, using uh, any dye. I don't usually stain it, but uh, it's a technique. You know? So people like using uh, triacinolone for that. And uh, I think you like using, tri I, I've seen uh, Natarajan's technique using a lot of triacinolone. And uh, what about yeah, you? For you macular like holes, yeah, I do use triacinolone for the PVD. Yeah. It's good though. It's, uh, the, the important thing is that you remove all vitreous possible and yeah. uh, removing tractum forces and uh, vitrex cutter and uh, delamination uh, using the uh, adjuvants if necessary, positioning. And uh, this slide, uh, this is just a repetition of what we said. And uh, it, this is interesting to see that uh, most people today, over 64%, they, they do uh, ILM, uh, they stain the ILM and the parspena vitrectomy. And uh, some people, uh, they, uh, you know, most using the, the dye, the most use the dye over 64% to peel the ILM and do vitrectomy. But uh, uh, I would say that 17% still quite high don't use the dye. So what the point of not using? They think it's toxic. They are not used to, the, to it. And uh, the thing is uh, that not very, uh, just uh, you know, 17 is not so, so low. They don't use the dye. And uh, some yeah. they do surgery with ocriplasmin still. And uh, some, they, uh, you know, from 10% below, they don't uh, peel the ILM. But mostly, 
and you have these uh, percentages, 64.25 and 17.86, they peel the ILM. So I'm used to peel the ILM, so I think it's, uh, it's better that you, you peel the ILM for sure. And uh, so that by peeling the ILM increase the surgical uh, closure rate, but more than this, you know, more than this percentage showing, I would say more than 90%. And uh, you have the uh, gas bubble and the positioning. This is a good example of a strict face down position for, for the patient. And uh, in the past we had these special chairs, special uh, places that the uh, head could be put, but I don't think that's very important. I think, I usually tell the patient, if you, be, you are in face down, but uh, if you are sitting, you put your elbows over your, sh uh, your knees, and then you're gonna be facing down. So wherever you are, even if sleeping, you, it's possible to be facing down, especially if you have the lens and if you don't want to get a cataract. But here, some studies show that uh, duration of face down prone position reported by several authors uh, with uh, positioning and uh, without positioning. It's interesting that the percentages from several authors here, including uh, you have uh, Tornambe in 1997, you have uh, 79 percent with C3 F8, and uh, still a high percentage of getting the hole closed. But at this time, he was mentioning without peeling the ILM. But when you peel the ILM, you have more percentages of closing compared to a uh, facing down position on the uh, uh, half of the slide above. But still, it's good, good to tell the patient to be facing down, but uh, if the patient does not face down very much, still his uh, chances of getting the hole closed if he has he, this, uh, some touch of the uh, gas on the macular surface uh, and uh, also avoiding the lens to be touched. And then if he had uh, the ILM removed, the chances for getting it closed are very high. So complications have, uh, some of them we have with all cases, some of them we have the, uh, with the macular hole surgeries. And uh, I like doing for my vitrectomy is J-dip. I, after I do vitrectomy, especially in pseudophagic patients uh -huh. that you don't see much of the retinal periphery, I like doing some lasers right. where I come in with, uh, uh, you know, with the infusion line first, but also with the instruments, uh, illuminating pipe and uh, cutter. I, I like doing the lasers on those areas. Where? Because uh, at the very retinal periphery, at the very retinal periphery, especially in pseudophagics, because they might have some very, very small breaks that you don't see. And so then you uh, uncover them by removing the vitreous. Uh, you do 360 degree laser? No, just uh, uh, focal points, supratemporal, supranasal, and uh, infratemporal at the uh, infusion line. Just a little bit. Just a very okay. small line, you know, a barrier laser, very small. Just, uh, it's good that when I go see the patient, I know the patient's mine. <laughs> I did that. And uh, it's like a mark. Mm -hmm. I know. And, I know. Uh, initially, yeah. they used to do, some some older surgeons were doing cryo to the sclerotomy side, just posterior to the sclerotomy side. Yeah, it's a good idea, laser. too. Good, good idea, too. I don't, it, it's uh, In difficult. fake eyes, especially because in pseudo fake you can do the laser, but in fake you cannot do the laser. Yeah, but I still do. I have the it. technique, I have the technique with the faking, even though the patient is faking, that I bend the eye and uh, I reach, I switch hands and then I, I reach even the supratemporal, infratemporal areas. And I'm going to show you later these uh uh, some of my, my surgeries, I don't touch at all the lens. And I still can do very peripheral with a very good lens peripheral without touching the lens. I still I do that. And uh, I, I will prepare some uh, takes from the very peripheral view for doing these lasers and i show you. 
And uh, we know that sometimes the patient is not happy and then we are happy because we closed the uh, macular hole, but some patients are still not happy because if uh, you have this uh, W pattern or V pattern, not very many times the, uh, the vision is, is good. Some patients complain about that, but the U pattern, the regular U pattern that you see, the normal uh, foveal depression, to have it closed, it's, it's a lot better. And so uh, about reoperation, the, we have uh, many statistics. And uh, the uh, uh, shorter time you have to decide whether you, you reoperate the patient or not, you could still uh, try it with uh, different techniques. When, uh, what is your preferable technique, JDP, if you have the uh, hole uh, open, it, it did not close, you did everything well, but the, the uh -huh. hole was a little long standing, so it did not close, even though the patient did the waist positioning, the, uh, the hole was uh, pretty large, and uh, it did not close at all. What is your preferred technique to get back to the surgery? Uh, see, basically, if it is, uh, if I'm sure that I have peeled the ILM well, and uh, the hole is still open with uh, elevated edges and some edema at the edges, then I would just try uh, injecting gas. Ah, okay. And A positioning, gas and positioning. And if I'm not sure if the patient has been operated somewhere else, then okay. I would go in and uh, do the repealing of the ILM and probably try to do the inverted flap or the ILM flap and put a little longer, long acting gas like maybe C3F8 instead of C3F8, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I do that too. Yeah, I do that too. And uh, maybe for large macular holes. I do that straight in the first, uh, you know, first retractor. Yeah, yeah, that, that is yeah. true. That is what I do. So I am not come across many cases of mine where the hole has not closed. I mean, either it closed by type 1 closure or type 2 closure, but generally it closes. So uh, very rarely, I don't remember a case where it remained open. Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, you see, we are, uh, today it's uh, uh, November 24th, 10 days ago, this article was published into uh, mm. Modern Retina, and by Linda Charters, she was mentioning here, um, uh, Tamer Mahmoud. Mm. Uh, interesting, mm -hmm. the trend, at least from his cases, and I have watched some of his lectures into some meetings, zooming in on the retina and also presentially he came to brazil and uh we've met in uh, american academy or you know retina uh, international congresses and uh about uh autologous retinal transplant this is very uh -huh. interesting and uh he mentions that autologous retinal transplant for macular holes a rel relative new procedure is providing anatomic hole closure in the vast majority of cases of large macular holes as well as increases yeah. in visual acuity. And I when we talk I've about... Seen, I've seen his videos, so I think, uh, yeah, so he does, it, it, he's taking uh, autologous retinal tissue from the periphery and then... Uh, transplanting it into the macular hole. Yeah, it's interesting that we know that that works anatomically, but then they yeah. are sincere here to say that uh, increases in visual acuity. Of course, these are not very much, uh, you know, uh, uh, visual acuity, uh, a lot better, uh, but somehow increases. Uh, I've watched his uh, lectures and the UC, the OCT, there are trials on that. And uh, as you see here, characteristics from the graft type. And uh, mm -hmm. as you said, in 84% of cases, the harvest site was posterior to the equator. So he gets the uh, harvest site uh, from the periphery. Okay. And uh, it's, it's interesting to do that people do different things. And uh, I think 
we should be doing whatever is better for our patient and uh, we should be searching for the whole closure, of course. And uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have the uh, patient satisfaction. And I will just uh, finish this uh, presentation here. As uh, you know, the strategies, strategies for the surgery. And uh, I will show you now into uh, some surgeries. We will go over one surgery here. And uh, as you said, I have uh, some surgeries in the, into the eye tube here, like the Big Mac, as an allusion for the, uh, the sandwich, <laughs> Big Mac uh, ILM technique for large macular holes. So I do this surgery for macular, macular holes. ILM folding techniques, I, I, I think we've we seen that some weeks ago. ILM peel for right. macular hole under uh, liquid before carbon liquid. Some patients have retinal detachment, and I found it was easier to peel the ILM under uh, perforal carbon liquids, as you, I, I know that you do yeah. that too. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, absolutely. In the, uh, what, what I want to show you, it's interesting, is this early ILM peel for a full thickness macular hole. So I was talking about that case that the patient had this uh, macular hole. He was operated, but it was a late, late, uh, uh, late stage, but uh, chronic macular hole, so it did not close properly. Uh, it closed partially, but then I was following up the fellow's eye, you know, his fellow, uh, the other eye. And uh, this is what I want to show you. This is a very interesting surgery. These are the three operative exams. The patient was asymptomatic. There was an incomplete TV. The uh, moving OCD was pretty normal despite that. Eleven months later, the vision dropped. A full thickness max hole was displayed in the OCD. A comparative OCT before and after the symptoms showed the actual effect. The uh, moving OCT now shows its extension and irregularity. The hyaloid now is completely detached. The surgery was performed four months after the initial diagnosis. An air fluid exchange was performed after the uh, core vitrectomy, where the vitreous was very gently removed thus avoiding traction during the procedure. ILM PO was next after staining the internal limiting membrane with red and blue. The ILM was removed in a clockwise maneuver to completely relieve the traction around the macular hole. We emphasized that we were extra careful not to go too deep, nor to tear the ILM too fast. This good outcome patients, and especially the fellow's eye situation, we must take the procedure longer, and it pays off. We decided to go a little further, so as to grab the temporal area to avoid any scaffolding formation in the post-operative period. Some endolaser was performed to actually prevent any iatrogenic holes that could have been created in the very periphery. Another AFX was next, and that was about it. The uh, postoperative OCT footage shows the complete closure of the macular hole. A comparative post-op OCT with the preoperative one displayed the normal anatomy resulting from the procedure. The visual acuity got a lot better, almost three lines, and the patient was happy with the procedures because she did not see no more distortions even though the OCT seemed to show some rearrangement in the outer retinal layers, hoping to stabilize with good time. Thanks a lot for your attention. You see that interesting, very interesting case, uh, uh, J. Deep, yeah. that I was telling you 
the the you know I don't like long to uh, decide on the surgery, but this case the patient already had this uh, uh, macular hole in one eye, and uh, he was operated, but he, because it was so chronic, he did not close properly. But then this eye that I showed on the video was the uh, fellow eye, and uh, you know in uh, a year. Uh, from uh, in between our uh, follow-ups, he developed his uh, metamorphopsia distortion and uh, the macular hole. So we operated him. He was uh, 2070. He got 2050. So actually, he was 2030, 2040, and then he got 2070 very fast. And then we we did a surgery, and uh, he was last time I saw him, he was 2050. But the anatomy was uh, a lot better with the hole closed. Of course, some distortions at the uh, uh, transition uh, area there and uh, photoreceptor, some, some, still some distortion. But then uh, I think he's getting better. So I, I like doing early surgeries because if we wait too long for, especially in, in, in uh, one-eyed patients, so we we could uh, waste you know time yeah so uh, do you yeah. like operating earlier or you you still wait and how long do you like waiting before deciding to go for surgery jd oh well i uh, if i get a full thickness macular hole i generally don't wait well, I, uh, I, I would advise I... surgery right away I think I I'm not here. Just just a moment. Let me turn this. Uh, okay. Okay. Could you could you repeat that for me? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Now. Okay. Yeah. It's okay now. Yeah. So generally, if I see a full thickness macular hole, then I would uh, immediately operate because I I wouldn't wait, even if the vision is. Uh, almost uh, 2020 like anything less than 2020 maybe 2030 on onwards i will operate because mm -hmm. uh, as you said most of them in our experience we have seen that they will progress and uh, the vision is likely to drop and then if you operate later the recovery of vision anatomical success is always good but the vision recovery is definitely less so i don't uh, generally wait uh, I immediately advise surgery, even if it is uh, just about 20, 30 vision or 6, 9 vision. If it is 6 by 6 vision, then, and if it's a small hole, like uh, less than 200 microns, we may give a month or two just to see if there is spontaneous closure. Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, if it's a little larger hole, I would immediately advise surgery. And uh, as you have described, I have had uh, such many such cases where one of the eye has had surgery done and it was a chronic hole and uh, although the hole closed, the vision did not recover and the other eye develops the macular hole and we operate immediately and the patient is almost 6 by 6 in so many of my cases they are about 2020 or 2030 mm -hmm. if we operate early in the other eye. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we should not I wait. follow the same, same way. I would not wait. Yeah, I was, you know, as a preventative uh, uh, thing. It's interesting that I you, I used to to play judo and wrestling since I was born, very early, and then I got this right. ultrasound into my own eye, and I saw a line. I saw this PVD, and I was so happy because you know, in the judo throws, you fall here, you fall you there. Fall. And I, might, I might have developed this uh, posterior vitro separation years ago, so that decreased my uh, chances of having <laughs> the macular hole. I was happy about it. Okay. <laughs> I did my own test. Okay. <laughs> I did a <the> self-test. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> right, right, right. But I, I, I have one uh, question for you. I mean, just what uh, is your uh, experience like... Uh, there are certain cases where you operate uh, and the macular hole does close, but they end up with slightly worse vision than what they came with. 
have you come across something like that yeah sometimes that happens yeah there is rp atrophy but, and yeah there, or there, uh, there are yeah unknown causes there, of but i have loss. that thought most of my cases if they get worse it's because of two reasons one is probably the patient had some cataract and the cataract got worse and then uh, i refer the patient or i operate myself uh, for cataract surgery this, this is one thing the other thing is right. that uh, this case the patient was so much happy because even though he was 20 30 or 20 40 before surgery but then he developed very fast his uh, this pvd and a uh, hole and uh, we did not uh way too much to operate and then he got 2050 40 to 50 but it's still not as good as it was before but uh he was happy even though we saw in the anatomy and the uh, OCT I have to give an update on the OCT and I think it's better uh, today but still some distortions there but he was happy because uh we uh, avoided the vision to for, from getting a lot worse and your question uh, is that should we get sad about that i don't think so because uh most of the cases we are happy because we close the hole but n not all patients are happy because uh you know we have these intrinsic uh changes in retinal structural changes and uh, my experience uh -huh. is that most of my cases they they get get better but some of them did not get as good as that could be because of uh, individual uh, differences uh, between the patients among the patients mm -hmm. but uh, some of them maybe 3% or less they are unhappy because they they so yeah think something could be so have you uh, come across better? some things like uh, do you think there is any toxicity associated with brilliant blue or uh, probably uh, uh, phototoxicity if you you know the light toxicity from the light pipe yeah or yeah. maybe touching the rp sometimes or sometimes you have a like multiple retinal touch or hemorrhages while you're peeling does that matter or how yeah what does is matter, your experience does matter. on that technique that uh, we went across some uh, weeks ago this technique i will show you let me share just a second to show you this is interesting you got to be very careful for not touching the rpe and uh, this style and folding technique is an example so you got to be very very careful uh, when you take the ilm this is the technique and by doing the ilm this is important and uh, here let me go further so we open we lift the internal limiting membrane here and so being extra careful not to touch the uh, the rpe this technique i was walking i was walking with the uh, ilm towards the, the the hole without forcing it down you see it? see here the tip is closed and just a, it's a very light touch of the ilm you got to be very sensible here not to, to apply much force otherwise it could touch the uh, right so besides that have you have you come across any like light toxicity or any brilliant blue dye related toxicity you know what i do for not having the uh, brilliant blue toxicity because i i really don't i i don't have there are many studies saying that uh, there are some but there are right. not very good studies on that you know that so but then right. i when i stain with the brilliant blue the uh, the eye gets stained just for one minute so i put the brilliant blue under air okay. and then okay. i switch it to uh, fluid 
just uh, uh, uh-huh. right after I injected, I just I switched the fluid, maybe 10 seconds. I just wait 10 seconds. And then the fluid comes and I will wash it out. So uh, I, okay. I don't uh, uh, leave the uh, brilliant blue too long there. I just wash it 10 seconds after okay. I put it. I, I have been waiting for almost two minutes. No, I don't wait. I just 10 seconds. It's enough. You see how the uh, ILM gets uh, stained? Very well stained. I how much uh, brilliant blue, how much uh, do you inject brilliant blue? Covering the posterior pole or how yeah, much? Just covering the posterior pole between the arcades, the major vascular arcades. As you see here, the vascular arcades. You see here, uh, the picture, it's stained here, it's not stained here. See? Right. So I just inject here, over this uh-huh. area, at the macro area, and it, it's enough. I don't need to stay here or here. Unless I want right. to uh, do another surgery for a recurrent macro, for example, I want to get some ILM from uh, the peripheral. But I usually stay and just uh, apply the Brilliant Blue on the macular area, and that is enough. Right. And so, of course, your concerns, and uh, these are my concerns as well, and uh, should be everybody's concerns. So I think on, in your uh, initial years, when you're just starting off to do ILM peeling, I think these are the things which which uh, you should keep in mind, because that time you take a little longer time to operate, and yeah. so probably you may end up doing some mistakes. Yeah, you are right. You are right. So, I so think ILM peeling is probably something yeah. which needs to be done as fast as you can. You should not uh, keep doing it for long. Because yeah. then you are likely yeah. to get some touch because your, your hand-eye coordination starts decreasing after, you know, 5-10 minutes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, trying to get the ILM you know, el- elsewhere, not on the foveal area, just around and avoiding vessels. Those those tips, they should be 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 done, and uh, otherwise we could have some complications. Right. So that was about it, Jadeep. I think uh, yeah. uh, you know I passed the slides very fast so that we could cover the whole thing and also so- show surgeries. And uh, right, right. It was a nice discussion. I thank you very much. And uh, this is going to be uh, on YouTube for uh, future referral. Thank you, uh, thank Aishwara. You. You're still there, Aishwara? Thank you very much. Uh, I think, yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. And you have a great day. Say hello to Natarajan, my friend Natarajan. Yes. yes. <laughs> Yeah, 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 definitely. I think he's uh, going on uh, another small vacation uh, this this week. Probably he's going to leave today or tom- tomorrow and come back next week, Tuesday. All right, all right. Thank you very much. I'll, and uh, Let's yeah. keep on, on the good discussion in the group. I will show you, I will send you some uh, some cases later this week. Sure. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. My honor. My pleasure. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.